Welcome everyone to the Mind, Body, and Spirit Cafe, where it is my great pleasure to have a fantastic guest on my show today, Mr. Mark Wallen, who is the creator of, the author of, If It, it Didn't Start With You, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle. Mark is a leading expert in inherited family trauma. As the director of the Family Constellation Institute in San Francisco, he trains clinicians and treats people struggling with depression, anxiety, panic disorder, obsessive thoughts, self-injury, chronic pain, and persistent symptoms and conditions. He is most definitely a sought-after lecturer. He leads workshops at hospitals, clinics, conferences, and teaching centers around the world. He has taught at the University of Pittsburgh, Western Psychiatric Institute, Kripula, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Mark, Kripula, Kripala. the Omega Institute, the New York Open Center, and the California Institute of Integral Studies. His articles have appeared in Psychology Today, Mind Body Green, MariaShriver.com, Elephant Journal, and Psych Central. And his poetry has been published in The New Yorker. So I will have your website at the bottom of the page, Mark, when this goes live. And welcome in. Oh my gosh, just to let everybody know, I had the distinct pleasure of attending. Mark's workshop at the University of Pittsburgh School of Social Work a month ago. It was absolutely amazing. Well, thank you for having me, Joan. Oh, my great pleasure. I just want to bring this up. I'm going to bring the Amazon link up and share the screen with our viewers. But first, I just wanted to at least show, this is the hardback version of It Didn't Start With You. And Mark has told me, that the paperback has even more good stuff in it. So when I share the Amazon page with everyone, get the paperback, get the audio, get the Kindle. Mark has <laughs> learning in all forms on his book. So you can get everything or what, however you learn. So Mark, how did you get started in this work? Well, like many people, I suffered, struggled with uh, a mystery I couldn't explain. Um, my my vision um, started to uh, dissipate in my left eye, and the, I was diagnosed with a chronic form of retinopathy for which there was no cure, and the doctors told me I was going to lose the vision in both eyes, and um, I, I couldn't see. This was, this was my lead eye and faces are now a blur and road signs are a blur. Um, so I, everything I tried, uh, juice fasts, hands-on healing, supplements, everything seemed to make it worse. So I didn't know where to turn um, and I ended up going on a search, a search that led me halfway around the globe, literally as far as Indonesia, to learn so, um, from some very wise spiritual teachers some fundamental principles, uh, one of which was the importance of healing our relationship with our parents. Um, for me, that was going to be difficult because my relationship was terribly broken, uh, but I heeded the advice um, of these teachers and I ended up um, healing with my parents. But in order to heal with them, I had to heal what sat in between, though I didn't know it at the time, it was inherited family trauma, um, specifically the fact that all my grandparents were orphaned in some way. In fact, three of them lost their mothers when they were babies or toddlers. And then the fourth, she lost her dad when she was one, but ultimately, of course, she loses her mother too because her mother's grieving. So this pattern of being broken from a mother's love, this is what passed down in my family. And this was what rippled in my body, the terror of abandonment, the terror of being left. I remember um, being about five or six years old, whenever my mom would leave the house, running into her bedroom, pulling open her drawers and crying into her scarves and her nightgowns, 
feeling, I remember it vividly, that all I would have left would be her scent, which would be true for all my grandparents who were orphans. That's all they did have left. I shared this with my mom about 40 years later. I said, you know, mom, I used to cry into your clothes when you'd leave the house. And she said, oh, honey, I did the same thing when my mother would leave the house. And my sister reading the book said, you did that too. You cried into mom's clothes. And I realized that it was a generational behavior. And many of us, like my eye, struggle with something we just can't explain, uh, an anxiety that strikes suddenly, a fear um, or a depression we can't get to the bottom of. And these are what I'm finding out, often residues of trauma that we have biologically inherited mm. from our parents and our grandparents and perhaps even our great grandparents. Um, Wow. I think what many people don't understand is when someone comes in to see me and they say, how did this happen to me? Did I inherit this? And I say, well, biologically, you may have inherited a predisposition, but now that I have met you and I've had, I've been a participant in family constellations myself, and I've actually had one done, which was absolutely remarkable. So now I'm starting to take, I take your genogram system, and I'm saying, well, let's look back and see what happened in your ancestral patterns. Something may pop up. Since your workshop, I'm learning to listen better. I'm learning to listen to the words that come up. Because especially with young people today, uh, the millennials, the stories don't seem to be handed down as easily from one generation to another. So young people today really, they may have a sense of it, but they don't know where it, the problem came from, where the root cause came from. So your book and your system is so invaluable to all therapists that work with family systems. This, your book should be an integral course in every marriage and family therapy program across the world because I don't know... It just won the Nautilus Award for psychology. Okay, there you go. Okay, people. <laughs> <laughs> All directors of counseling and psychology programs that are watching this podcast, there you go. Let's get with the program here, literally. Okay, Mark. So this is a segue in how can trauma be passed on yeah. from a parent to a child? So let's say our grandparents experienced a trauma. Um, this would change them biologically, physiologically. Specifically, a trauma causes a, um, a chemical change in the DNA. And this can ch change the way our genes express, sometimes for generations. Um, specifically, there's a, a chemical tag or an epigenetic tag that attaches to the DNA and it tells the cell Oh, because of this thing that happened, we need this type of support. So it tells the cell to use or ignore a specific gene that will create a benefit, that will create an adaptation. And then the way the genes are affected, change, this changes how we act or feel. For example, we can become fearful or uh, sensitive or highly reactive to a situation that's similar to the original trauma that our parents or grandparents experienced um, as a way of protecting or as a way of, in a Darwinistic sense, as a way of adapting us to survive the trauma that was experienced in that generation past. For example, if our parents come from a, a war-torn country, um, so there's bombs and bullets and explosions, they would develop a skill set um, of perhaps quicker reaction times or sharper reflexes or the ability to um, duck or sense some danger. And they could pass this ability, this skill set forward through the generations. 
But the problem is here, born in suburbia, um, we that skill set can be keep us hype in hyper arousal or hyper alert or keep us hyper vigilant, waiting for a catastrophe yes. that, never, that never arrives. And here we are, we've inherited a stress response with the dials set to 10. Uh, uh-huh. And this can be dangerous or harmful for our bodies the way uh, the orphan trauma in my family um, after generations caused in me a blindness that ended uh-huh. up changing. So I never told the end of the story. The end of the story is um, after I healed my relationship with my parents, my vision came back. And then I realized there was something to these principles. And so for the past 23 years, I've been teaching um, these principles about the importance of no rejecting, no rejecting a parent, no excluding a trauma, no, um, the, the more we, we leave unfinished in our generation, the more that can pass unresolved into the next. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people will ask me, why is this happening to me? And now I'm suggesting, so it doesn't happen to your children. Beautiful, 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 Joan. Yeah. Well, so well put. And then they say, okay. I said, apparently it's your role in this life to stop this pattern from moving forward. Beautiful. So let's do it. Exactly. Okay, part of me wishes I'd met you 20 years ago, and the other part of me says, I'm grateful for knowing you now. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm so happy and and grateful for you that you got your eyesight back by healing this trauma. Oh, my gosh. Unexpected gift. So there is everyone watching who doesn't already know. If you have any skepticism in the mind, body, and heart connection, duh, here it is. Mark was able to heal his eyes. There was a point um, where I just had done so much inner work where my eyesight um, still hadn't improved, and it didn't matter. There was a point where the, the I was okay even though my eye wasn't okay but as i kept progressing and doing this work my vision ended up coming back which was unexpected in fact when i go to the ophthalmologist he asks me to read the sign i go well it's an e there's a g there's a p and he says you can read that and then he looks <laughs> at my retina and says you can be able to read that your retina is speckled and scarred with um, scar tissue um but again Which has me believing that we're more even than the tissue, that we're more even than the scar tissue. Oh, yes. He explains that I shouldn't be able to see through all the scar tissue, and then he speculates or postulates that maybe the light signals bounce off the side of my (laughs) But, you know. He doesn't know about the plasticity of the brain, obviously. Perhaps even the plasticity of what we think is dense and set in cement Yes. Even physiologically. Mm, Beautifully said. So how how can someone tell if he or she might be suffering from an inherited trauma? What are the signs? So I've discovered that there are definitely some telltale signs. We can begin to struggle with a fear that strikes suddenly or an anxiety that comes on after a certain event or a depression that we never get to the bottom of. Um, for example, um, this fear or this symptom that strikes suddenly can come upon at a certain age, maybe age 30. And we don't think to connect that age 30 um, was the age that mom and dad split apart or grandma became a widow. And then all of a sudden around age 30, we look at our partner and we think, yeah, the, the fire's gone or my partner doesn't do it for me anymore. But we don't seem to connect that there's an internal shutdown point as though there's an ancestral alarm clock that starts ringing when we reach a similar age. Um, it can also be when we hit a certain milestone or event in our life. For example, we go to get married and then we have a shutdown. We go to have a child and we have postpartum depression. 
We move into a new place. And all of a sudden, that moving into a new place um, brings up this alarm clock from our people being pushed out of a country <coughs> a generation or two ago. Or we, we go to have a baby and all of a sudden there's a change. Or, um, for example, I wor once worked with, I had one more example. Um, oh, or we leave home for the first time um, or uh, we get rejected by, that's the one I wanted. We get rejected by a partner. And all of a sudden, it brings up that earlier abandonment during the in utero experience or mm -hmm. an attachment issue. I once worked with this woman who, she didn't have any, any anxiety until she went to have a baby. She became pregnant. And now she was consumed with anxiety. Um, but she didn't understand what the anxiety was about. She came to me, said, I have terrible anxiety. I said, why? She goes, I don't know. You know, it was just this complex of anxiety. When we began to unpack it, we found that the anxiety began as soon as she became pregnant. And if you look deeply at the language of this anxiety, you heard her say, I'm terrified that I'll harm my child. Now we've got what I call core language, okay. drama language. Mm -hmm. And I ask my questions that, you know, I outline in the book. And one of those questions was, uh, what did anyone in the family have cause to feel the same way? Did any other, in other words, did anyone in the baby, in the family harm her baby? And she said, she began to say no. And then she said, oh my goodness. And a story came to mind. And she started to remember a story she heard only once that they weren't allowed to talk about, about grandma, who when she was a young woman, she had a, a, a newborn and she lit a candle and it caught the curtains on fire, caught the house on fire, and she couldn't get her baby out of the house. And the baby mm -hmm. died. Mm -hmm. And here she was reliving aspects oh. of her grandmother's trauma. And as though it was her feeling, he had inherited her grandmother's experience. With your work, now I'm able to listen with a new ear. My training in obsessive compulsive disorder takes me in a different direction if a woman comes in and says, I'm pregnant and I'm afraid I will harm my baby. In the past, I've taken this as an obsessional fear. Now that I'm learning from you, I'm going in a whole different direction. You have the perfect training. OCD training, training to work with OCD, lets us unpack the intricacies, Please. unpack the language of OCD. So when somebody comes to me with OCD, I don't just ask, um, so you have OCD, let's, um, what I'm asking is, tell me in particular, in your worst moments, in the depth of the OCD feeling, what are you thinking in that very moment when you switch on the light, switch off the light, turn on the stove, check the car? What's that very thought in that moment? And often they'll say something terrible will happen. So what I found at the bottom of OCD often lives, uh, if I don't do this thing, something terrible will happen. And that something terrible often lives in the family history. Right. Yay! I am all about getting to the truth and I am all about getting to the root of the problem. Good. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh. How, how can we break the cycle of inherited family trauma? So the, the first thing that we need to uncover is our trauma language, this very thing that we're talking about. Okay. And if we can listen for this language that we all carry, it's in our fears, it's in our descriptions of our uh, relationships, it's, it's all over the descriptions of our boss, our job, our parents, our partner, our worst fear. Um, so I lead people in the book through all, all these types of questions get us down to unpack this language. Once we have this language, it's like finding the missing piece of the puzzle. And once that puzzle piece gets put into place, it's, 
it's almost like we can now see the whole picture and have a context for explaining why we feel the way we feel. So we've made the link. Now that we've made the link, we've got to break the cycle. And the way we break the cycle is by having a new experience that's potent enough, powerful enough to be able to change the brain. This can be an experience of comfort or support or gratitude or compassion or loving kindness or generosity, basically anything that brings us or allows us to have peace and strength inside. Now, we have to practice the new feelings and the new sensations of this new experience. And when we do this, we're literally pulling traction away from the trauma brain, oh. pulling traction away from the midbrain, the uh, 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 amygdala-driven limbic brain. We're not just pulling traction, we're pulling glucose, oxygen, um, circulation, blood flow from the um, thick uh, midbrain and we're bringing it to the areas of the brain where we can integrate and then have neuroplastic change, specifically the prefrontal cortex. Um, so the idea is to um, have a new experience and then practice the sensations and the feelings of this new experience. Uh, in other words, repetition and focus, which we know um, from Norman Doidge's book, The Brain That Changes Itself. Repetition and focus is how we create new neural pathways. Well, it's not just neural pathways, right? If we're building these two structures that now are beginning to wire together, the dendrites of one moving into the dendrites of the other and forming a new neural structure, um, as Head in 1949 coined, what fires together eventually begins to wire together. But we're also creating uh, um, uh, neurotransmitter change and hormonal change. In other words, the neurotransmitters now can become stimulated and begin to fire in a different way. So we're, we're, we're now releasing um, uh, uh, um, serotonin where there was not, dopamine where there was not. Um, hormones like oxytocin and estrogen are begin, beginning to stimulate. And even the genes themselves are beginning to um, change. In other words, the genes that cause the stress response are beginning to function in a new way. Biology can be changed without medication. Absolutely. I'm not against medication, but it's my last line of treatment, not my first line of treatment. Yes. yes. And that, and that ah. Medication is necessary. Yeah. And, you know, we need to create a situation where somebody has enough calm to begin to look in an introspective way. Right. Now, let's get to the book here. I mean, when I was reading some of the questions that I wanted to ask, how will readers benefit from reading your book? I was thinking, how could readers not benefit from reading your book? Oh, wow. But I'll let you explain to our viewers how they could benefit. So, so I wrote this book for those of us like myself who had struggled with conditions we couldn't explain, mysteries. Many of us are walking around with a mystery and, and we can't get, can't get any insight because it's not in alliance with our, it's not in the context of our life experience. So how can we know there might be information that's missing? For example, you said earlier that the younger generation might not even know because the older generation keeps the doorway to the past sealed. And the reason it's keeping the doorway to the past is there's this idea that if we don't talk about it, we immunize or insulate mm -hmm. our kids from, they don't need to know this, but it's the opposite. We do need to know it. So yes. I teach readers how to become detectives yes. of their own trauma language. And I, and I ask, as you know, 12 questions in one chapter and several questions in other chapters that have us distill this language down into trauma language, what I call core language and then link this language to either events in utero or events in our early childhood or to events in the family history. Once we make the link to these events, and many people say, 
you know, I, I didn't know this information, but I went home and I asked my mom or I asked my cousin and mm -hmm. it was true. This information from my trauma language, from my fear lives in my family. I often get this question, mm -hmm. how do I know if my parents didn't tell me and yes. they're deceased or I'm adopted and I have no pathway or my parents aren't talking, how do I know? And I always say, let's look at your trauma language. Okay. Let's look at your repeating behaviors. Let's look at the potholes that you continue to step in. Let's look at the choices you continue to make or not make. Yes. And that shows me, it gives us a very clear picture of to what's missing in the family history. history. Wow. And so I also wrote the book, not just for people who um, didn't, you know, had mysteries that they lived with, but I wrote it for clinicians. For me, I threw the kitchen sink in here. <laughs> and for me, this is a manual right. for therapists right. of how to learn the core language approach and then how to do a traumagram in the new way, meaning not just the traumagrams that we all learned in social work school, but the traumagrams that now bring in the victim, the perpetrator, okay. the, the, the people um, who gained an advantage in our family history, those we gained an advantage, those people belong in our family history, in our traumagram now. And to then, to make those links, and I wrote this book so we can also, uh, you know, have a, uh, fields of medicine, fields of clinicians in, in trauma therapy can now have the tools to work with inherited family trauma. So it's not such a mystery. We as okay. clinicians now know what to do. Read the book. It's in there. Really? Thank God. And with that, I'm just going to share my screen for just a moment because all right, everyone. This is Amazon. There it is in all its forms. Kindle, hardcover, paperback, audible. So Mark says, get the paperback. Get it all. <laughs> get your textbook for how to heal inherited family traumas. First, uh, you know, I'm going to leave you, I'm going to leave you with three insights. Um, first, you know, if we or one of our family members are struggling with something we can't get to the bottom of, you know, unexplained depression, anxiety, um, OCD, phobias, fears, um, I always tell people it's important to shake the family tree and see what falls out. What, se what secrets were never talked about? What stories never got told all the way? What traumas never healed? Um, secondly, it's important to talk about the traumas in our family history and try to work through them so we, so we don't pass this forward to our children. The more we heal our own stuff, the more, you know, that's the best way to immunize. People say, well, how do I protect my children? Work and heal. Work on and heal your own stuff. And then in this way, you really do immunize your kids to some degree. Now, you know, the more, also, the more we talk about these traumas, the more we can bring relief to our children who are struggling with aspects of inherited family trauma and, and don't, know, don't know they are. Um, I found that when we ignore the past, it can come back to haunt us. But when we, when we explore it, we don't have to, to repeat it. And, and thirdly, I like to tell people, do the practices in the book. I spend the whole, I dedicate the whole last third of the book to teaching these new, neuro, these new neuroscience tools that create neuroplastic change, um, how to have these new experiences, and then how to practice these new experiences so that the sensations and the feelings become installed in our body so that we can change our brains. Brain. Wow. Mark, I'm going to have it at the bottom of the video, but your website is? MarkWolin.com. Uh, Mark, M-A-R-K, W-O-L-Y-N-N.com. And, you know, they can get the book there. They can go on Amazon. Um, but thank you so much for having me, Joan. Oh, this has been 
such an honor to talk with you. I continue to learn from you, Mark. Mm, and you. may all of our clients continue to heal their family traumas. Wonderful. I thank you, sir, for your time. Have a wonderful day. Thank and thank you, everybody who's watching this. This is so important. Please study Mark's work. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Mark.